Okay, is everybody ready? And we start with, what does that say? Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Exactly right. And guess what? We're beginning the book of Devarim. Not Deuteronomy. It's really known as Devarim. And what does Devarim mean? These are the words. Here you have. Can anybody read that? I really helped you here with the vowel points. Ha. Okay, this is the hey. Ha is the word the. And then the dalet. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, the dalet is the D. And then what's that next letter? Bait. But it doesn't have the little white dot in the middle, so it has a V sound. Okay, dev. And then what's that letter? The race or the R sound. Devar. And then the M is the M. Devarim. All right, I want you to be able to slowly learn Hebrew, which means the words. These are the words that God spoke in the wilderness. Now, let me begin with this. How many have ever heard the words, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed <laughs> because his compassions fail not? Does anyone know what book of the Bible that is in? What? Lamentations. Can you imagine? They're lamenting the destruction of the temple. They're lamenting the destruction of Israel, of Jerusalem. And yet they're saying, good thing the Lord's merciful. <laughs> I mean, wait a minute. Uh, how many of us have experienced like total destruction and then we've got mad at God? Why did you do this? And yet here he's saying, well, it's because of the Lord's mercy. We ourselves aren't even consumed. Well, the reason I bring that up, uh, that's in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. This Tuesday is the ninth of all. All right. Who has never heard of the month of Av or the date ninth of Av? I'll explain it. If you, it. Okay, if you haven't heard of it, what this is, we are basically in the month of Av. That's A-V or Aleph Beit. And what's amazing, Av means father. And yet this is the worst month in all of history for the Jewish people. <clears throat> it was on the ninth day of the month of Av, which is next Tuesday, to get an idea when it is on our calendar, that the 10 spies brought the bad report. Because of that, this day's been cursed throughout all of history. All right. The first temple was literally destroyed on the ninth of Av. The second temple was destroyed on the ninth of Av. Okay. All the Jews were kicked out of England in 1290 on the ninth of Av. All the Jews were kicked out of Spain in 1492 on the ninth of Av. World War I started on the ninth of Av. Hitler's proclamation to kill the Jews happened on the ninth of Av. Does anyone see a pattern? <laughs> okay. God says that, I think it's in Zechariah 8, this day there has been a fast day, a mourning day for 2,500 years. And there's a prophecy that some year this day is going to turn from a fast day to a day of rejoicing. Now, unless you know when that is, you'll never know if that prophecy is fulfilled. Okay. What could that mean? We don't know what year is going to happen. But we know the 9th of Av is next Tuesday. Could Israel be attacked next Tuesday and they decisively win, which will turn it into a day of rejoicing? Okay, so that means we need to know when the 9th of Av is to know when maybe Iran may attack or Hezbollah. You following me? This is why you have to be on God's calendar, which is why we have a calendar. So people can track prophecy. That's what it's for. So <clears throat> the whole book of Deuteronomy takes place in what time frame? It takes place in 37 days. It starts on Shavuot 1, and Moses dies, which is 30 days, and Moses dies on Adar 7. The same day he was born, on the 7th of Adar, that's when he dies. So what he's doing in the book of Deuteronomy is at the end of the 40 years of wandering, Moses is about to die, and he summarizes the last 40 years. He says, oh, he's got a whole new generation. 
Everybody has died that he took out of Egypt. Think about that. Everybody's died except for who? Joshua and Caleb. Everyone else is dead. So now he has to present the covenant that everyone heard at Sinai that none of them heard. He's kind of summarizing everything before he goes. This is a new generation that's going to take the promised land. And so let's look at what he's really going to uh, be talking about here in just a moment. Let's begin with Deuteronomy 1. It says, these are the words that Moses spoke to all of Israel on this side of Jordan in the wilderness. Now, how many of you know words are important? I mean, think about it. In John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Do you realize, how did God create everything? By words. His speaking words, and guess what? He spoke Hebrew. He didn't speak English. And so let's take a look at Proverbs 18.21 concerning words. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And what does the tongue do? It speaks words. But do you realize your words can kill somebody or your words can build up somebody or your words can be meaningless? <laughs> it's your choice. <clears throat> I say this because I so love whenever I go to the grocery store or talk on the phone, I always want to build that person up or make them feel good. My goal is not always to get accomplished what I need to get accomplished, okay? Like at the store, I'm not there just to get my stuff and to get out. I'm there to try to brighten someone's day. I'm serious. It makes life so much more fun, especially when you can see the reaction. You can see someone who's all grumpy and they're mad or something. You know, and then you start talking and joking with them or whatever, and you've just changed that person's whole day. How many of you know you can also say something and ruin someone's whole day? You know, I mean, your parents can do that to you as kids, okay? So, and we just need to realize we need to use our tongue. Think of your tongue or when you're talking, you're actually producing something. You're actually creating your world that you want to live in. If you always speak negative, you're creating a negative world for yourself. If, you, if you're in a negative world and you want to live in a positive world, you need to start speaking positive things, not just to yourself, but to everybody. It's amazing how that works. Look at Psalms 34, verse 12 and 13. Or, yeah. Who is the person who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Well, then keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Amazing. It's right there. Look at Ephesians 4, 29 and 31. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with malice. How often do we hear people that are just negative? They speak negative. I remember, boy, it was... 50 years ago, a <laughs> long time ago, there was a, a book written by a gentleman named Charles Capps, uh, and it was all about, you know, the tongue, uh, and it was a great book. Now, when you think about evil speech, which is known as what? Lashon hara, the tongue that is evil, throughout the 40 years of wandering, <clears throat> The Israelites had constantly blamed Moses because of their wilderness experience. And in the end, they needed to face the hard truth. It wasn't Moses' fault. It was their fault. It was their own negative attitudes that had kept them in the wilderness. As a matter of fact, if we look at Deuteronomy 1, verse 34 and 35, listen to what Moses says. It says, and the Lord heard what? Not just your words, the voice of your words, which implies, can I have some water? Can I have some water? Do you hear the voice? Same words, but a different voice. 
God says, look, I heard the tone of what you said. And I was angry and I swore saying, surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land, which I swear to give your fathers. The, God not only listens to our words, he listens to the tone of our words. That's why there's another verse in Deuteronomy we'll get to eventually that says, uh, basically, because you did not do what I told you to do with joy. You realize you can actually do what God says, and it's not good. Uh, how would you like uh, you tell your teenage son to dump the trash? I ain't going to do it. Okay, fine. And he grabs it. I mean, and he does it, and it's like, oh, well, no, thank you. Okay, so it's not just doing the commandments. You have to do them. With a happy face. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Let's look at Deuteronomy 1, verse 2 and 3. It says, there are how many days journey? It was only 11 days from where they were to Mount Sinai. That's all it was. 11 days. And it came to pass in the 40th year... <laughs> wow. In the 11th month, on the first day of the month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord given him in commandment unto them. Wow. If you remember, they had traveled three days. They only had seven days to go, and they're there. And oh my gosh, look what happened. Okay, so the key thing about Deuteronomy, I'm going to kind of go over the whole book as a uh, a summary, and then we'll look at it chronologically. But there are key words in the book of Deuteronomy. And one of the key words is the word covenant. The word covenant appears 26 times. What is another important word? Love. Love appears 21 times. The word remember occurs 14 times. And then don't forget appears nine times, which basically means remember for a total of 23. And then we have the word Shema, which means what? Hear and obey. Hear and obey. So often we tell our kids to dump the trash. and They go, I heard you. I heard you. And you go, I don't want you to hear me. I want you to do it. Then, as a matter of fact, it occurs uh, 18 times also. Now, the first word we're going to cover today is the word covenant. Now, you're going to find in the second half why that is such an important word and why the King James translators were crazy. All right, let's start with Deuteronomy 4, 23. Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget. He doesn't want them to forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. And then you go and make a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you to do. Let me see. <clears throat> okay. Look at Deuteronomy 4, 9 through 13. He says, only take heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, which means to guard, protect your soul, lest you, what, forget the things which your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, but what are we supposed to do? Teach them to your sons, your sons' sons. And then it says, especially the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Sinai, when the Lord said to you, gather everyone together and I will make them hear my words. And what was the purpose of that? That they can learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, that they may teach their children. And you came near and you stood under the mountain and the mountain was burning with fire in the, unto the midst of heaven with darkness and clouds and thick darkness. And look at this. And then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of fire 
you heard the voice of the words. You saw no similitude, only you heard a voice. And then he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even 10. And you know what? When it says 10 commandments, how many of you know it's not the word commandments? That's a mistranslation. It's the 10 words. He declared the 10 words. Now, we're going to, as many of you know, where Danny Ben-Gigi and I are working on the New Testament right now, we're making lots of changes, thousands of thousands of changes. Uh, but then we're going to do the Old Testament. And when we do that, we're going to be correcting all of these that are mistranslated into the English. So you'll have kind of like a whole new Bible. Okay. <clears throat> and then it says, uh, he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even 10 words, and he wrote them upon the two tables of stone. So you have to realize this is not Moses' covenant. Moses tells the world what God told him to be his covenant. If you remember, the Israelite says, we don't want to hear his voice. That was the worst thing in history for them to declare they don't want to hear God's voice directly. They want an intermediary. Okay. Now, the other word besides covenant, or what were, what were they to remember, one of the things that, and I say this because this is things that we need to put in our mind that we need to remember. How many of you know that someone told you, don't forget this, what do you typically do if you, if you care and you don't want to forget? You write it down. Some people will put a string on their finger, <laughs> okay, or whatever. You want to write it down. If I, yeah, I'm getting old, okay, and I don't remember everything. And I tell people, email me. That way it's at least in my computer, and if I don't remember, I can go back and retrieve it. And so let's look at some of the things, one of the things that God told us to remember that I think is important for us today. They're to remember their past slavery. So often we don't remember our past. I mean, some people... They get out of drugs or alcohol or whatever, and they don't remember how hard it was, and so they end up going back to it. It says in Deuteronomy 5.15, I want you to remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt, and it was the Lord your God who brought you out of there with a mighty hand, a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. All right, so we're to remember that we were at what time slaves and we're to remember the Sabbath day because God redeemed us. The other thing we're to remember or they were to remember was their great deliverance. Look at Deuteronomy 7, 17 through 19. God says, if you say in your heart, well, these nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and then to all of Egypt, the great temptation which your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand, the stretched out arm, whereby the Lord your God brought you out. So shall the Lord your God do unto all the people of whom you are afraid. Okay, let's do that today. How many of us are afraid of the giants in our own life? We get caught up with things we're afraid of. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't know if it's good or bad. <clears throat> I mean, it could be a bad thing, but I just have no fear. I really, I really believe that God is in control. Now, I will never put myself in jeopardy or do something to test the Lord, but I am so convinced if it's not my time, it's not going to happen. And if it is my time, there's nothing I can do about it. Does that make sense? Uh, many of you know I've told the story. I've almost died about 10 times. I've had guns at my head twice, and they said they're going to blow my head off. Okay, major car accidents, major medical malpractice. I was almost eaten by lions in South Africa one night. You remember? Oh my gosh, so many times. And I, I really settled with the fact that if it's not my time, it's not going to happen. It's that simple. And if it is, there's nothing I can do about it. So for me, I just want to, I just say, Lord, don't take me until I get the job done you've assigned me. That's what my prayer is. Okay, uh, where are we at? Okay, now, the other thing that they're to remember, as we can see, they had to remember their, that they were slaves. They got to remember that God delivered them, 
And guess what he did next? He gave them divine leadership. He didn't just dump them in the wilderness and said, see you later. Deuteronomy 8, 2, he says, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness. And what was the purpose? To humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Wow, only someone who's full of pride would say, you ain't the boss of me, God. But how often do I do that? Do we do that? And uh, I think it's, it's amazing that it says God did things to know what was in their heart. We would think God would already know our heart. But he did things. I think more than anything, so we could know our heart. How often do we deceive ourselves? Do all of you remember my story about the coffee in the cup? There are some of you that never heard the story of the coffee in the cup. Okay, well, I don't need to go over it yet. Okay. Um, then the other thing we have to remember is past rebellion in Deuteronomy 9, 7. Remember and don't forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the very day that you left Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Now, he's telling this to the new generation. They didn't leave Egypt. They were born <laughs> over there by the Sinai. And yet God knows what is in their heart. Look at divine judgments and Deuteronomy 24, 9, they are also to remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam when they came out of Egypt. What did he do to Miriam? Does anyone remember? Leprosy. Why was she smitten with leprosy? The evil tongue. The very thing I'm talking about. Her words. They're also to remember their past. A lot of times we think we're supposed to forget our past. Well, sometimes it's important to remember your past because we don't want to repeat it. They say if uh, you forget history, you're condemned to repeat it. Some things we have to remember. Look at Deuteronomy 32, 7 through 8. He says, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, he'll show you. Your elders, they'll tell you. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Now, when you read that verse, what comes to your mind? There was no Israel. Israel didn't exist. So how in the world in Genesis 10, 11, when he separates all the nations to the 70 nations, there was no Israel. That kind of tells you God knows what he's doing before he does it. Okay, and why, if you read Genesis, there were 70 people of Israel that went into Egypt. That's why there's 70 nations. And how many bulls did Israel kill during the Feast of Sukkot, which is seven days long? 70 bulls. This is what's amazing. The nation of Israel were to be kings and priests. On Yom Kippur... Aaron would make atonement for himself and his family. Then he would make atonement for the nation of Israel. And then on Sukkot, since Israel has been atoned for, they were to make atonement for each one of the 70 nations by slaying a bull. The devil was so smart, he took the stupid nations, had them destroy the temple, which was the very thing that was being used to make them righteous with God. I mean, he is smart. But sometimes we cut off our nose to spite our face, as they say. Now, here's some key thoughts. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6, they answered the Lord, and it says, Is this your answer to the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is he not your what? Father, this is the very first time in the Bible that God declares himself a father to Israel, who's given you life. He has made you and given you your place. 
And again, the Hebrew word for father is Av. Abba is daddy. Av is dad. And wow. All through the Bible, Isaiah, every place, he says, oh my goodness, you don't even remember me. We're to remember him and all he's done. As a matter of fact, look at Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 9. It says, you are a holy people to the Lord, your God. The Lord, your God, has chosen you. You've been picked to be a special people to himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Can you imagine, of all the people on the face of the earth, uh, God goes, I pick you. Now, was it because they were so smart or cute or no? It was a random choice. God just looking and says, I pick you. How many of you, when you're in grade school, you would have people pick teams for baseball, volleyball, and you're always hoping you would pick first and you were picked last. <laughs> you know, some of you may know what I'm talking about. You want to be picked first. Uh, there's something that God really uh, taught me when I, right after I became a believer when I was 19. I uh, joined this youth organization, and we traveled around the United States, and we would be witnessing on the streets and things like that. It was called the Agape Force. And uh, we spent three months in what was called DTI, or Discipleship Training Institute. And for three months, we had teachers come in that would teach us we had like Dave Wilkerson, uh, Winky Prattney, Leonard Dravenhill. We had uh, just some phenomenal teachers. But uh, then we'd also have fun time playing sports, and we were playing volleyball. Now, how many of you have ever played volleyball before? How do you know there's a lot of time one person that wants to play everybody's position? Anyone relate to what I'm talking about? Maybe it was you, maybe not. I was that person. <laughs> I was the person that, why? I wanted to win. And so if there was someone that was too short or not strong enough, I would always run. And I thought everybody would be happy because we won. But they weren't happy because I played their position. <laughs> you know, so how do you define what makes someone a winner? And the Lord really told me that what makes someone a winner is when they feel like they've been chosen. So what God told me is, instead of me trying to win the game, try to make other people feel like they're winners. And so for me, it's like when I would pick teams, the person who was picked last, I would always pick first. And guess what? By picking the person who's always last pick first, even if we lost, they'd go home and they'd be bragging they won because they were picked first. You know, but see, so that, that well, my whole life changed after I got saved. It, it was like, man, it's not about me. What a concept. It's about making the other people feel good, which is why I like making people feel good at the grocery store. Whenever I meet anybody, I smile because it's about making them feel like they're a winner. And if you make other people feel like a winner, you're going to be a winner. So it's not about necessarily winning the game. It's about making other people feel like they are winners. Okay, now... Look how this goes. Then it says, the Lord didn't set his love upon you. He didn't choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. It was because the Lord what? He loved you. And because he would keep the oath, he swore to your fathers. Has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt? Know therefore that the Lord your God... He is God. He's the faithful God. Now look at this. He keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. What? There's grace in the Old Testament? There's mercy in the Old Testament? So here we have. Mercy, who is mercy shown to? Mercy is shown to those who love and keep his commandments for a thousand generations. If a generation is 60 years, that's 60,000 years. It's only been 6,000 years since Adam. If it's only been 6,000 years since Adam, 
the commandments are still valid for another 54,000 years. Think about that for a minute. How can you say God's commandments are gone when he shows mercy to those who love and keep his commandments for 60,000 years? But here's the other thing that may, you, you may question. Why do I need mercy if I keep his commandments? If I keep his commandments, why do I need mercy? Anybody think about that? Because you don't keep them all the time. <laughs> None of us keep them all the time. <clears throat> and just because we don't keep them doesn't mean they're going to, they're gone away. The difference is God will show mercy to those who love and keep his commandments. Think of it this way. Uh, two people appear before a judge for a crime, and one of them says, I'll never do it again, and the other one says, I'm going to keep doing it for another 100 years. Who's going to be forgiven? Okay, so it's the whole concept that we have to understand God's love and mercy is to those who don't throw his commandments out. It's to those who keep them and guard them. Now, here was the problem. Let's look at Deuteronomy 1, 22 and 23. Moses says, you guys came near to me, every one of you, and you said, we are going to send men before us. They will search us out the land and bring us word again by what way we must go. Into what cities we'll come. And the same pleased me well, and I took 12 of you, one of a tribe. Well, what happened? After 40 days, they come back, and they are afraid of the giants. Okay, again, this event happens next Tuesday. Now look at verse 27. You murmured in your tents, and you said it was because the Lord hates us. That was the problem. That was the problem. They felt God hated them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Their whole, here God's their father. They're their kids, and he thinks their father wants to kill them. Totally, it's from the heart. Look at Matthew 25, verse 24. Here you see God had given money or talents to different individuals, and then he came back to see how they did. And it says, they which had, uh, then he who received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know that you're a hard man, reaping where you haven't sown, gather where you haven't strewed. Oh my gosh, the servant, his opinion of God was he was hard, he was mean. But he wasn't hard and mean. He just wanted to make sure the job got done, but that's not being hard or mean. The problem was his heart. Look at Matthew 25, uh, uh, Deuteronomy, I mean, chapter 1, verse 29 and 30. Moses uh, says, I said to you, dread not, neither be afraid of them. Or oh, this is Caleb, I think. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. So here Joshua and Caleb are telling people not to fear because their eyes are on the Lord. If you remember, there were three sons of Anak that they saw, three sons of Anak that they feared. But what they didn't see was the three forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were buried in the earth. They were focused on the giants on the earth, not the spiritual giants in the earth that God is keeping covenant with. <clears throat> and then look at verse 31. And in the wilderness <clears throat> where you have seen how that the Lord your God bear you as a man bears his kids and all the way that you went until you came to this place yet and this thing you do not believe the Lord your God. You know what this is saying? This is saying, look, this is how a man bears his child. So here you have these two pictures. This is what God wanted to be. He wanted Israel to see him as their father who was carrying them on his shoulders into the promised land. And yet they never saw God that way. They saw him as some big, mean uh, person. That's not the way it was supposed to be. So look at Deuteronomy 1, 32 through 35. It says, yet in this thing, you did not believe the Lord your God. Now, what does it mean to believe or not believe? A lot of people say, well, I believe in God. Well, 
Is that a bonus point? The devils believe in God and they're flat out worried about it. So when it says you did not believe the Lord, they knew the Lord existed. So what does that mean? They didn't trust him. They did not trust the Lord who went before you to search out a place to pitch your tents in fire by night to show you by what way you should go in a cloud by day. And the Lord heard the voice of your words. He was angry and he swore saying, surely there should not one of these men of this evil generation see the good land which I swear to give to your fathers. So during the Exodus and the 40 years in the wilderness, Israel was known as the generation of no faith. I can't think of a generation in history that didn't see more miracles, more signs than that generation, and yet they were known as a generation of no faith. And it's the same thing. When Yeshua was here on earth, that generation was a generation of no faith. And he, it's, he was speaking to his people. And then Yeshua says, when I come back, will I find faith on earth? It could be the church could be the most unfaithful generation of that generation. And they're looking for signs and miracles. And, but this time they're going to get them, but it's going to be the wrong person doing the signs and miracles. Um, uh, they of all generations knew full well that God existed. They had manna falling from heaven. They saw the sea split. <clears throat> so let's talk about faith or believing in God and what that means. It's not belief in his existence. Real definition of faith is shown in our walk after we believe God exists. Will we go forward? Like when they're splitting the Red Sea, God was waiting for one of them to jump in before he split it. <clears throat> the problem we have today is many of us only see the worst things we only look at, that's all we look for. Some people see the glass as half full. Some see it as glass as half empty because they are focused on the negativity. We always see the worst. Um, and we believe that that person is worthy to be hated. How many of you ever heard of baseless hatred? You hate someone for absolutely no reason. That's what happens to a lot of the Jewish people. People hate them, but they have no valid reason to do it. We need to respond with baseless love. We need to show kindness. We need to show care for others. We need to see the best in them and to build others up simply because we can. When you look at the ninth of Av, I have up here on the screen, the first ninth of Av that made history was the sin of the spies. And we see the reason why they didn't believe in the basic goodness of God. And the first temple was destroyed because the people fell into the core sins of idolatry, immorality, and bloodshed because they didn't believe in the basic goodness of the commandments. And then in 90 AD, the second temple was destroyed because of baseless hatred. And this is because they didn't believe in the basic goodness of one another. And so we have to overcome that and Look at this. This is uh, uh, amazing. In Deuteronomy 1.39, he says, Moreover, your little ones <clears throat> that you were afraid would be a prey, and your children that this day have no knowledge of good or evil, they're going to go there, and unto them I will give it, and they're going to possess it. Wow. You know, sometimes, and I see this throughout Scripture, it's a pattern we need to learn from, how many of us know, even our politicians, when it comes to the debt, they pass it on to their children and the next generation. And the next generation, uh, we want to send our children to fight our wars. Look at Deuteronomy 145. It says, you returned and you wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice nor give ear to you. Wow. Everyone thinks if I cry out to the Lord, he's going to hear me. Well, there's going to come a time when people who think they're believers are going to cry out to the Lord. And guess what? He's not going to hear. Why? He says, because when I called you, you didn't hear. Pretty simple. I think it's amazing that the very generation who was given bread from heaven, water from a rock, had no faith. 
Now, how many of you know what tribe belongs to the month of Av? What? Simeon. And there's 12 months. There's 12 tribes. The month of unbelief is Simeon. And what does Simeon's name mean? Shema to hear. And it was the tribe of Simeon who would not hear. So this month, I want you to, every month is a pattern. This is the month of hearing or not hearing. Are we going to hear from the Lord? The Lord speaks, but we don't hear. Just like there's stars in heaven, but if you're among the city lights, you don't see them. And just because you don't see them doesn't mean it's not there. All right. And I've told you before about one of the first houses that we rented when we moved from Kansas to up here, little did I know, because I didn't know the area, it was like two blocks from railroad tracks. And at four in the morning, this train is just blaring its horn. And it's like, oh my God, what have I done? And, uh, but after a week, I didn't hear it anymore. Because I didn't hear it doesn't mean it's not there. I tuned it out. This is the month we have to be careful we don't tune out God because God is speaking, but we have to get into the wilderness. That's where he speaks to us. You can't see the stars in the city lights. You can't hear God in the midst of all of the audio perversion and everything that's out there. You have to shut your ears to that if you want to hear from God. So believe it or not, this month, practically, as of today, realize we are in the month that we need to be hearing from God and he is speaking, but have we, just like the radio station, tuned him out, turned to another station? Um, let's see. Deuteronomy 2, 4 and 5. It says, command the people saying, you're going to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, okay? And they are going to be afraid of you, but take good heed to yourselves, do not meddle with the Edomites. I will not give you their land, not so much a foot breath, because I've given it to Esau for a possession. Wow. And yet Esau was totally afraid, and for no valid reason, out of baseless hatred, they wouldn't let Israel through. Look at Deuteronomy 2.9. And the Lord said to me, Moses, don't distress the Moabites either, because I gave them to Lot. And in Deuteronomy 2, 19, he says, when you come against the children of Ammon, don't meddle with them or distress them because I've given that to the children of Lot. And so uh, one of the things that I think is so important, how many of you know we're in a war? Spiritual war. But guess what? Pick your battles. There's so much that is so insignificant. Who cares? And we're battling over things that have no importance. Look at Deuteronomy 2.10. I'm talking, how many of you know Israel was afraid of the giants, right? Well, guess what? Esau faced giants and they won. Ammon and Moab both faced giants and they won. And God gave them their land. Why wouldn't he give the sons of Jacob their land as well? Deuteronomy 2.10, the Amins dwelt there, a people great, and many and tall, just as tall as the Anakims, which are also counted as giants, but the Moabites call them Emmings. Wow, they conquered the giants. And look at Deuteronomy 2 and 12. The Horims also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead. And then the Ammonites also conquered the giants in Deuteronomy 2, 20. It says that also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt there in old time. And the Ammonites called them Zomzumims, a people great, many and tall, as the Anakims, and the Lord destroyed them. So he's saying, look, guys, the Lord destroyed all of these other people who are evil. Why would you not think he would take care of them? And then I will close with this. Uh, today is called the Shabbat Chazin, which means the Sabbath of vision, which is always right before the ninth of Av. And look at Isaiah 1, 1 through 4. Here we have the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of all of these kings. And he says, hear heavens and listen, earth. The Lord has spoken. I've nursed and brought up children, but they have rebelled against me. 
Here the ox knows his owner, the donkey his master's crib, but Israel doesn't know. My people don't consider. O sinful nation, a people loaded with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they've forsaken the Lord, they've despised the Holy One of Israel, they are strange and gone backwards. We do not want to be a repeat of that generation. The time of Yeshua was a repeat of that generation. And Yeshua says, when he comes back, will there be another repeat of that generation who want to do away with all of his commandments? So let's stand. <clears throat> and let's pray. Avinu Malkinu, our father, our king. We do not want to be rebellious children. We want to be good children. <clears throat> We're all at a different stage in life as far as how long we've been believers. But Father, I pray that each and every one of us would have the heart of a child again and we learn just to trust you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Renew that relationship that we had at the beginning, Father, where we just want to fall in love with you. Speak to each one of our hearts. Make our hearts tender again toward you. And Father, we want to thank you right now for all those that are here locally, all those from around the United States that are tuned in, all those from around the world that are tuned in. We know you said you wanted to magnify the Torah, make it honorable once again. Father, thank you for all those who give into your ministry here at El Shaddai, because that's what we want to do. We want to make people just fall in love with you again. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Buckled in. Now we're going to talk about Solomon, who was the number one best human king there ever was, and also the biggest failure. Like they said, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Well, he was very famous, but at the same time, it was horrible. We're going to take a look at that. And we're going to go back to Deuteronomy that we just began with the Torah portion. And look at chapter 17, verse 16. When Israel had wanted a king, God said, okay, when you get a king, he shall not multiply horses for himself. But look at this next part. He's not to have the people return to Egypt to multiply horses because the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. This is so important because how often do we find when we get saved, we have these temptations from the past and we tend to go that way again. Sometimes we'll even drive around the block and seeing if we can fight the temptation of going back to there again. God says, don't go back there. As a matter of fact, what's the Hebrew word for return or repent? Shuv is the root word, shuva, uh, like teshuva. But shuv is the key element. And what letters make up the Hebrew word shuv? The shin, the vav, and the bait. Now, the shin means to destroy, to consume. The vav is connecting that to something. And the bait is a house. The key to repentance is to burn the house down. So you can't go back to it. The problem is we don't burn the house down. We take our sins, put them in jail, and go visit them. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so God says, I don't want you going back to Egypt ever again. Well, here we go. I got this nice little picture. Let's see how Solomon did. He had 40,000 horses for himself. How many horses does one need? Can you imagine 40,000 horses for who? Himself. Oh my gosh. And he had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. How many does he need to take him to the store? I mean... 
what in the world? But guess what? Look at this, 1 Kings 10, 26. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots and with the king at Jerusalem. So here he is. Look at this. He's got 1,400 chariots. But you know what is really sad? Look at 1 Kings 10, 29. They weren't supposed to go back to Egypt to multiply horses. And it says, a chariot came up and went out of Egypt for 600 shekels of silver, a horse for 150. And so for all the kings of the Hittites, for the kings of Syria, they brought them out by their beats. Do you realize Solomon not only did what he wasn't supposed to do, these were the modern day tanks. He sold them to the enemy. Can you imagine if Israel sold nuclear material to Iran? This is how stupid Solomon was. Number one, he went back to Egypt, which he wasn't supposed to do. Number two, he got horses and chariots from Egypt, which he wasn't supposed to do. And number three, he sold them to the enemy. Do you remember what the word Hittite means in English? Terrorists. He was selling horses and chariots to the terrorists. Oh my gosh. That they weren't supposed to make any covenant with. Now, let's look at Deuteronomy 17 again, verse 18. It'll be when the king sits on the throne of his kingdom, he has to write for himself a copy of this law in a book and has to be from the one that's before the priests, the Levites. What is that saying? Number one, it says he has to write for himself. In other words, the king cannot ask a Levite to write it for him. He has to get a copy from the Levites, the original or whatever, and then he has to look at every word and write every single letter, every single word with a Levite looking over his shoulder to make sure he does it correct. And why does he have to do that? So the king doesn't realize or think he's above the law. Are there any politicians who think they're above the law? How about all of them? Wow. A king who's not above the law. And not only that, he has to have someone look over his shoulder as he writes his own copy to make sure he doesn't make any errors or tries to alter it. So in this way, he not only has to write his own scroll, he has to read it and he has to have a tutor over him to be sure he understands it. The purpose is that he will ingest God's word and incorporate God's laws into his heart. Because look at the next verse in Deuteronomy 17, 19. He's got to carry it with him everywhere he goes. He has to read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. Be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes so his heart is not lifted up above his brethren so that he doesn't turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Okay, so here, I got this little picture here. I can just see Moses writing his own Torah scroll as, or not Moses, Saul, uh, Solomon. Okay, so here's Solomon having to handwrite his own Torah scroll, and the Levites are watching over it, but imagine, he's, if he's supposed to read it every day of his life, and we think we are kings and priests, we better be reading it every day of our life. Amen. Think about that. Christians always say we're kings and priests. Well, then why don't you do what a king and priest does? You know, you need to be reading that every day of your life. Now, look at this. Deuteronomy 31, 9 through 13 is amazing. Moses wrote the law delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who are the ones that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses said to them, at the end of every what? Okay, and that is a Shemitah cycle. 
And it's at the end of the Shemitah cycle, it says, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all of Israel has come to appear before the Lord their God in the place which he shall choose, you shall read this law before all of Israel in their hearing. Then it says, gather the people together, men, women, children, stranger that's within your gates, that they may hear, that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. And their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you go over to possess. Does anyone know what that is called? The ceremony. The hakel. That's right. It's called the hakel. And what they would do is not read the entire Torah. And it was the command. The king is the only one who has the authority to tell everyone to come. Right? No one else can. Oh, you come here. Who? You ain't my boss. Okay, so only the king. So it was responsibility of the king in the Shemitah year, at the end of the Shemitah year, to gather everyone together. Now, you got to remember, there were no printing presses. There, it takes a year, a year to write a Torah scroll. And, you know, Solomon's having to write his own Torah scroll. Who knows how long that took. But Solomon is supposed to have his own Torah scroll, and he's supposed to read out of it. There were no printing presses. Okay, so not everyone had ever heard one word of the Torah. Think about it. The only way they would know what God said was unless they went to a Levite who happened to have a scroll or a priest or hear it from the king every seven years. Now, they would not read everything. They would read Deuteronomy chapter 1, 1 through chapter 6, 3, which is basically that I was talking about this morning, just a historical summary. Moses is telling everyone about their history. Then they read Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, which we know is the Shema. And 11, 13 to 21 is a repeat of the Shema. So I want you to understand what they're hearing. They're not hearing Genesis. They're, they're only hearing the summary of Deuteronomy and only parts of Deuteronomy. Okay, then after that, they are going to hear uh, Deuteronomy 14 uh, through 26, 12 through 15, and it's all about the importance of tithing. But then guess what? The last leg the king has to read is the rules that apply to him. Now, you would think the king doesn't want everybody to know what rules apply to him, but that's what he has to do. And we're going to look at that here in just a minute. Okay, let's see. Now, if you remember, how many times a year does everyone have to appear? Three times. Passover, Shavuot, and Tabernacles. But the seventh year, known as the Shemitah year, every man, woman, and child, just the men were required otherwise. But now everyone is required, even the stranger. You know, I often wondered if Solomon skipped reading parts of the rules for the king, or if he actually read them to everybody. But if you remember, the purpose for the king was to realize he's not above everybody else. Well, who thinks they are wise enough to be God's editor? If God writes something, who thinks they should go over it to make sure he did it okay? Evidently, uh, many of the church thought they could. But look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18. Look what Yeshua said, I verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle, ill well in no wise pass from the Torah until everything is fulfilled. Does anybody know what jots and tittles are? Does anyone not know what jots and tittles are? Well, you're all smart. But let me show you. The Torah scroll, there's different fonts on your computer. Well, there's different fonts in Hebrew. They have uh, letters on the bottom are the same as the letters above, but the letters above, if you'll notice, they have these three little things on top, and it actually looks like a crown. Do you see that? Those are the tittles. Those little three things above the letters, those are called the tittles. Now, here's a picture of a Torah scroll. 
And there are only certain letters that had that. What's this letter? Shin, noon, up there, the Sade. Now, those are the ones, but you'll notice some of these letters. Oh, as a matter of fact, before I do that, can anybody tell me what word this is? What's that word? Okay, well, I'll start this way. What is this first letter? What's that letter? The Yud Hey Vav Hey. That's God's name. All right. Now, you'll see. Oops, let me go. Oh, nope. Yeah. Okay. Notice the Yud has a tittle on it, but it's only one, not three. So the other letters, like the Shin and the Noon, have three. But the yud has one, and the letter he has one. You following me? So these are the tittles. The jot, there's no j's in Hebrew, refers to the letter yud. Okay? So when he says not one jot or tittle, he's saying not the letter yud is the tiniest letter of all of the Hebrew. So he's saying not only the smallest letter, but the smallest tittle on the smallest letter won't go away. Okay, so in other words, the smallest part, not even any, nothing is going to be go away until all of the Torah is fulfilled, which we know hasn't happened yet. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17. Well, guess what? That is what the king had to read every seven years. Now, how long was Solomon king? Forty years. That means at least five times minimum he read this. Okay? And he has to read it in front of everybody. But guess what the sages say happened? There's a famous midrash or commentary in Exodus Rabbah 6.1. And it says that Solomon arose and was diligently studying the reason God gave the commandment to not multiply wives. And he said, well, wasn't it to just keep his heart from turning away or being lifted up? He goes, well, because I'm so wise, I can multiply my wives and my heart won't turn away. I'm full of wisdom. That won't affect me. Therefore, I can multiply wise because the reason is so my heart doesn't turn away. I'll make sure it doesn't so I can have multiply wives. That was his, reading, uh, his thinking. So in all of his great wisdom, Solomon supposed he understood the reasoning behind the commandment, thinking, well, if I can just keep my heart from going astray, I'm free to multiply wives. Because he thought he understood the principle of the Torah. It meant he didn't need to obey the literal meaning of it, which is what much of the church thinks today. But get a load of this. Let me show you. Here we go. Uh, this is, and he shall not multiply wives. Okay? And I want you to notice, uh, how many of you know that no in Hebrew is what? Lo. Lo is no. And no or lo is spelled with, this is and, no, or and not, multiply wise. Lo means no. Now, does everyone hear the word lo? You don't see the difference if you are reading it. You only see the difference, uh, I mean, if you're speaking it, everyone hears lo, they think that means no. But if they're looking at it, they could tell something is astray. If it has the letter hey instead of all left. This also says low. But the Bible said no, which is low with an aleph. But when Moses wrote it, he changed the aleph to the letter hey. So watch what happens. You can go to Google and search this. Lo, which means no, says, and he will not have many wives unless his heart goes astray. But when Solomon 
wrote it with, you can see the low, see that? The low and no. But now we're going to switch it to a hey. And now it says, and he will have many wives and his heart won't turn away. So just by switching the aleph to a hey, it changes the meaning. And the sages say that Solomon changed the letter aleph to the letter hey. Well, and there's, you see the letter, the hey and the aleph, the only difference? Well, look what's next. What is next? The letter Yud. And they say that the Yud went up to heaven and said, Lord, Solomon has just changed a letter. And basically, I'm next. And if he changes that letter, maybe he's going to get rid of the smallest little letter as well. And God replied, Solomon and a thousand like him are going to pass away, but the smallest tittle will not be erased from you. This is why most Christians don't know, but in Matthew 5, when he said that, everybody knew he was talking about Solomon. That Midrash was written a long years before Yeshua ever came. That has been around forever, that commentary, because Solomon multiplied wives. And so when he said that, everyone knew, oh my gosh, when he said that not one jot or tittle will pass away, he's talking about King Solomon. Okay, now, look at 1 Kings 11.4. It came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. So the story, this Midrash is teaching this. Well, guess what it says then in the Midrash that was written over 2,000 years ago? It says it would have been better for Solomon to clean sewers than to have this verse be eternally written of him. Wow. Well, in Christian theology, we've erased whole sentences and chapters of the Torah because we've assumed ourselves to be wiser than the Torah. We've taken our cues from King Solomon rather than King Yeshua. And if that's true, it would also be better if the church cleaned sewers rather than play at theology, which is where we get replacement theology from. There is a book that I own that is called The Hebrew Goddess. It's by Raphael Patai. And uh, he pub it was published by Wayne State University Press. And it states on page 50. Now, this is a Jewish guy rewriting about history. And listen to what he said. He says that, how long did Solomon's temple be, exist? It was about 370 years. It says that of the 370 years during which Solomon's temple stood, of the 370, at least 236 of those years, or two-thirds of the time, there was a statue of Asherah in the temple. They were not to make an Asherah idol, and it was in Solomon's temple for 236 years of the 370 years. That is amazing to me. So, let's, uh, I only have one more teaching on Solomon, and then the next week we'll start the Song of Songs. I just have to show you this other thing on Solomon. But so far, let's summarize what we've learned. In spite of being beloved by God, God called Solomon his beloved. He was blessed by God. He was given abundant wisdom. He was given fame. He was given fortune. He was giving, given power. He was given authority. And how did Solomon thank God for giving him all of these gifts? He went against everything God required as a king. He multiplied wise. He married strange wives. He multiplied silver and gold to himself. 
He multiplied horses to himself. He built altars to pagan gods, thousands of them. He was the first king of Israel to sacrifice his own children to Molech. He was an arms merchant selling arms to the enemy. He took all the credit for the building of the temple. He tries to give away part of the promised land. He lifted his heart above his brethren and he thumbed his nose at God twice. Now you get a better idea of what Solomon was really like, which is why people are going to be so deceived when the Antichrist comes because he is like a type of Antichrist, not Christ. He's going to get peace in the Middle East, which is what Solomon did, but it was by breaking every covenant. It was a false peace. It was not a true peace. And this is who the world is looking for to bring peace in the Middle East. East. So what I believe, I mean, so many people tell me, look, I found the Antichrist. I know who the Antichrist is. My attitude is, who cares? I really, I don't care. Because what we have to realize is what the Antichrist will be like. Solomon was a total narcissist. That's how you're going to be able to identify the Antichrist. Look at, does he follow Torah or does he not follow Torah? Now, to give you an example of how bad things can be, now, I'm going to show you some big errors in the King James Bible, and I'm very sorry for those King James only, but now that we've gone through the first half of the teaching, let me show you some things on your notes. Look at 2 Corinthians 3, 6 through 8. Uh, let me show you it first up here. Look up here at the screen. And it says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament? Wait a minute. There was no New Testament at this time. That's completely wrong. How could King James call it the New Testament? It's the New Covenant. It's not the New. The New Testament talks about the New Covenant. But here it puts of the New Testament not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth. But the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Horrible translation. If you look at the notes, this is basically what it's going to be in the new Bible we're coming up with. Is we got rid of all the haths and bringest and broughteth and bold. I mean, we got rid of all that. So we have, who also has made us able ministers of the new, what? Not New Testament, the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stone, was glorious, so the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, not for the glory of his countenance, but for the glow of his countenance. I showed you his face was glowing in Hebrew. Which glory they have, which was to be done away, which is uh, really the heart and the tone of that is horrible. It's better translated as the glory was not to be standing forever. However, the, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So as I showed you before, it was talking about the new, uh, the first covenant. It was glowing. Well, how much more glowing will the new covenant be? Now, if you look at 2 Corinthians 3, 9 through 11, I have it up here as well. Look at this first. These are the King James that we're changing. For the, they say, if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Now look how much better it is on your notes. Verse 9 through 11, for if the ministration of judgment, which referred to the first covenant, is glorious, how much more does the ministry of righteousness exceed in glory? 
For how is the glory of the first ministry compared to the value of the weightier ministry? For if that which is short lived was glorious, how much more that which is eternal is glorious. Now, do you see how that looks so much better than this and it makes more sense than this? And then we go to uh, the next one, verse 12 through 14. Look what they did again. It says, seeing them that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, not as Moses who put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that, which is what? Abolished. But their minds were blinded until this day there remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Now you hear about, oh, it's taken away in the reading of the Old Testament. What, do you, what comes to your mind? When they read the entire Old Testament, that's not what it says. The veil is done away in Christ. Here's how it should read on your notes. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly, look to the end of that which is what? Not abolished. The word is finite. But their minds are blinded for until the same day the veil remains untaken away in the reading of the old covenant, not the Old Testament, which veil is done away with in the Messiah. And so let's look at this here. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, it's talk about the New Testament. So we think New Testament and Old Testament. But actually, I have here, their minds were blinded. And then verse 14, we just read, because it's the, the reading of the Old Testament. So here they got New Testament, Old Testament. But back then, there was no Old. Did you know there wasn't even an Old Testament back then? All there were were scrolls. There was an Isaiah scroll, a Torah scroll, uh, you know, there was a Jeremiah scroll, they had Esther scrolls. There was no Old Testament. Nothing had been combined until about the third century AD. Did they even have an Old Testament? How in the world can he say the reading of the Old Testament? There wasn't an Old Testament in Yeshua's day. They were individual scrolls. He's talking about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. But these are the kind of corrections that we're going to be making. We're going to get rid of all the eth, kill eths, and the, you know, view ests. Okay, and so, now let's see. And then in 2 Corinthians 3, 15 through 18, it says, Even to this day Moses is read, the veil is on their heart. Nevertheless, it's in your Bible, it says, When it shall turn to the Lord. We replaced it with Israel will return to the Lord because they're talking about a people group, not an object. The veil will be taken away and the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all with open face beholding is in the glass. The glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Okay, does that make sense? So with that said, let's stand.